Thank you. How many of you here have had a family member or a friend with Alzheimer's disease or another dementia? Oh, wow. Way too many is the answer. Um, three years ago, almost three years ago, my husband, Ron Glaser, developed very fast-progressing Alzheimer's disease. Ron had been a really smart man, um, really warm, funny. He had been a, a wonderful scientist and a terrific administrator. He was my primary research collaborator and my best friend. Ron had never been at a loss for words, but his speech became garbled, and he had difficulty speaking and making any sense. Much of it was nonsensical. He had difficulty understanding even simple sentences. He had always taken great pride in his appearance, and he became unable to dress himself, to bathe, to shave, to brush his teeth without assistance. I'd always envied his directional sense. He could drive somewhere once, and a year or two later, he could find his way back because he remembered landmarks. He became unable to find his way around our house where we'd lived for 12 years. Last December, we were watching television. I was sitting beside him on the couch. I had my arm around him. We were snuggling. And he turned to me and he asked, Who are you? That was one of the worst moments. What I want to talk with you today about, what I want to share with you, is research on caregiving and how it's related to health. What I hope you'll take home from it is the many ways that stress can actually affect your health in ways you may not have fully appreciated. My research story about caregiving begins in 1988. I got a call from Enid Light at the National Institutes of Health. Uh, she'd seen some really nice work we were doing with medical students where we were showing immune changes during exams um, and that lonelier medical students were faring more poorly immunologically. And she said, you should be studying caregivers. Well, I at that point knew zero, nothing at all about caregivers. But the way she described it, when I thought about it, it was a really important problem. What happens when you have a really chronic stress? What happens with your immune system over time? And that set us on a journey that was one of our major paths in research for the next 20 years. Well, one of the first things we struggled with was, how do you get health-relevant consequences? Um, how can we measure health-relevant consequences of the immune system? You can measure a lot of different facets of immunity, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're health-relevant. Ron had a really great idea. He said we should use vaccines because you can give everybody something useful immunologically and you can watch how their immune system responds. It's, if you have a poor vaccine response, um, it suggests that you're at greater risk for infection, for viral and bacterial infections. So we started by doing a study where we were comparing spouses who are caregiving for a spouse with Alzheimer's and non-caregivers who were their age mates. And what we found, you see in the, the figure there, was the, we're looking at the percentage of people who responded to the vaccine, the fourfold responders. The caregivers in red clearly had a poorer response to the vaccine than our non-caregivers in blue. But there was a second part to that story as well. Age magnifies the effects of stress on the immune response. The older you are, the more stress matters. Think of it this way. If we think of aging as a glass of water this full when we're 18, perhaps when we're 65 or 70, it may only be this full. And if we add stress on it, ooh, I don't like that level. So it really matters um, how, and how, how old you are and how stressed you are. It becomes a much greater issue. But if perhaps you're thinking, well, I'm not older and I'm not a caregiver, so this really doesn't pertain to me, well, you're out of luck, too. Uh, <laughs> Because one of our earlier studies was with medical students when the hepatitis B vaccine was relatively new. And we found that stressed medical students, those who were most stressed and most anxious, took significantly longer to develop a protective antibody response to the vaccine. So when you go for your flu shot this fall, and I'm sure we all will, take your emotional temperature. Well, we were interested in what other kinds of health consequences we might see 
that would be important related to stress. And Phil Maruka, who was a member of our group at the time, said, we should be studying wound healing because the immune system is really important for wound healing. I thought, well, that was a great idea, so I spent a lot of time going through the surgical literature, trying to find a good model for wound healing. I talked to surgeons, I couldn't find anything. Because people like Dean Kent have this unfortunate habit of closing wounds after surgery. And we wanted to look at wound closure. So we decided to try something else. We borrowed a technique from the dermatology literature. We wounded people. <laughs> what we used were punch biopsies, like you see on the slide there. We created a pencil size eraser wound, pencil eraser size wound on the arm with, with local anesthetic. People always wince when I talk about this study. I had, was wounded twice myself in the name of science and getting the study ready. <laughs> and it really was not a big deal, but people do wince. So the effects we found were actually much greater than we expected. We found that our caregivers took 24% longer than our very well-matched non-caregivers to heal exactly the same small standardized wound. And caregivers also reported greater pain. And that's one of the themes we see in the literature as well that's developing over time. When people are stressed, they experience pain more intensely. And again, if you're thinking, I'm not a caregiver, I'm not older, so I'm home free, nah. Um, Phil was a periodontist, Phil Maruka, and I worked with him on a study with dental students. Um, Phil said, you know, oral wounds are really cool, we should really look at oral wounds. So he recruited dental students who allowed him to place a, a one wound on the hard palate um, at the end of summer vacation, and a second using that same punch biopsy on the other side, three days before the first major exam of the term. It took students 40% longer to heal their exam wound than the wound placed after summer vacation. In fact, some students took twice as long to heal exactly the same small standardized wound. And no student healed his or her own wound as rapidly after exams as they did after vacation. Stress has really large effects on wound healing. Well, we, our Lancet paper was the first uh, demonstration of stress and wound healing, and that was back a ways, but a lot of that area has grown. And I recently read an article where they were talking about how people who were stressed before surgery have slower recoveries, greater risk of infection, and, are, and greater pain. So that what we see that we were demonstrating in the laboratory really has some clinical correlates as well. Something to keep in mind if you're heading for surgery or one of your loved ones is. If you look at this slide here, think about how many of your family members may have one or more of the conditions listed. It, they're really very commonplace, so it would be unusual if none of them did. Um, and this is just the short list of what's been linked to inflammation in recent years. It's a clear growing theme in the literature about the importance of inflammation for health, especially as we get older. And it's relevant to the final study that I want to share with you. In this study, what we did, we wanted to follow people over time to see what actually happened with inflammation in caregivers and, and very similar non-caregivers. So we followed them for six years. We got blood samples twice a year for six years. So we could look at the change, the slope of change in inflammation over time. And you can see in that solid line, uh, this, this is showing changes in IL-6. It's an important inflammatory marker. That's all you need to know. Um, what you see is the slope of change there related to age at the bottom is much, much steeper for our caregivers than for our non-caregivers. The average rate of increase is four times as great. But that's only part of the story. Because one of the journal reviewers, when we submitted the article, said, well, what does that mean in terms of health? So I spent a lot of time going through epidemiological literature, trying to find what the health consequences might be. And a lot of that literature was talking about how the upper quartile was a particular area of risk, the upper 25%. So if I applied that to our data, our caregivers would cross that line of risk around age 75. Our non-caregiving controls would cross that line sometime after age 90. So our caregivers would spend 15 years more in that red zone of risk. Well, if all that is true, you should be saying to yourself, potentially, well, what about mortality and caregivers? And the answer is, unfortunately, yeah, that's there too. Rich Schultz published a really nice article in the Journal of the American Medical Association, where he showed that 
stressed caregivers using epidemiological data, stressed caregivers had 63% higher mortality across four years than non-stressed caregivers or controls. I was really honored when JAMA invited me to write an editorial to accompany his piece, where I talked about how our data really dovetailed with his and really showed how those health effects could occur. The work I've described is possible because of I work in the Institute for Behavioral Medicine Research. It is a really fantastic group of researchers. And we're able to create cutting-edge mind-body work because we are so strongly interdisciplinary. That list you see there are all the folks with whom, with whom I work, and it's a great group. They are a really tremendous group. And I was trying to highlight some things, and I didn't want to forget anything, so I just want to highlight a few areas. One of our researchers is studying prenatal stress and how it affects the mother and the developing baby, pathways through which stress affects pain responses, how stress affects recovery from traumatic brain injury, how exercise speeds wound healing, how mindfulness meditation training reduces inflammation, and then one of my favorite, because it's my own. You may have read about it in the uh, New York Times on Tuesday or heard on NPR. We published some recent data showing that uh, how stressed you are will uh, affect how you, your metabolism and inflammation following high-fat meals. Then in our group, we're able to go truly from bench to bedside, from good basic science models with mice to human studies, so we can, we can really see mechanistic pathways as well as what happens in people. And our research has really gone from, beth, from bed to bath side. <laughs> You know what I mean. <laughs> um, if you go to caregiving websites these days, or Alzheimer websites, as I have, um, you'll often see descriptions with the um, cautions to caregivers to take care of their health. We certainly weren't the only group studying caregivers, but our work was really foundational, because what we did was establish really important health consequences in understandable ways. Two years ago, I was visiting my internist for my annual physical. She asked how I was doing, and I said, well, not so well, I'm a little stressed. And she said, why? And I told her about Ron. And she started saying, you really need to watch your health. There's this research on caregiving and caregivers. <laughs> and I realized she had no clue about my role in that research. <laughs> At that moment, I realized our research had truly gone from our bench to my bedside and to that of other caregivers. Thank you for your support of the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center that helped make research like this possible. Thank you. Thank you. Jan, that was a very compelling uh, discussion about the effects on stress, and um, I, I know I was, uh, it was a very poignant to make it even personal. So, um, uh, you've shown how uh, stress is magnified by age, uh, but also its effects even in uh, younger cohorts. Um, tell us a little bit, um, in, just from your view, uh, in terms of lessening the effects of stress. You've mentioned exercise and other methods. With, how can someone uh, reduce stress? We all are okay. in those situations. Can you tell us your own personal views of that? One of the things we find in our research very clearly is the importance of close personal relationships. When people are stressed, um, having people around really matters, people who care about you, people with whom you can talk. But I'm fortunate in having with me Dr. Bill Malarkey, one of our uh, faculty members who is an expert on resilience and who will be back in our discovery area, who can also talk to you about a variety of anti-stress interventions. We have Tamar Gurr as well. Uh, she's um, an expert on stress and pregnancy. And then there's, a, there's Dr. John Sheridan, who I think you might find particularly interesting as well. He has a, a mouse model that he calls social reorganizational stress. Um, I think of it as a leadership transition model. Um, what he does is he takes a dominant mouse and he introduces it into a cage uh, that already has an established hierarchy and he looks to see what happens with the physiology. So looking at our new leaders here, I think this might be particularly relevant <laughs> to many of you. <laughs> okay, Jan. <laughs> Thank you.